What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another Tidal Gardens Coral Spotlight. If you're new to this channel, Tidal Gardens is a coral farm located in Copley, Ohio, and this is the place to talk about all things coral reef related. This video, however, is about sun corals of the genus Tabastria. There are similar corals to Tabastria, such as Dendrophilia and Balanophilia, and they have slightly different appearances but the same basic care requirements apply to all of them. Sun corals get their name from their bright yellow coloration and that, well, sun-like appearance of each polyp. Despite their bright sunny name, these corals are non-photosynthetic, which means that they don't get any energy from the light, unlike most corals in the hobby. In fact, they are probably the most well-known non-photosynthetic coral in the hobby and have been a fixture in the industry for decades. Their popularity is rooted both in their beautiful appearance as well as the challenge to keep them alive and thriving. The most challenging aspect of keeping Tabastria, or any non-photosynthetic coral for that matter, is keeping them properly fed. Oftentimes, Hobbyists grossly underestimate the amount of food that's necessary to keep these corals alive. The result is that the coral slowly starves and opens up less and less for feeding, ultimately leading to its death. Luckily, of all those non-photosynthetic corals that are in the hobby, Tabastria are some of the most aggressive feeders that can be fed a wide array of meaty foods. The black variety of Dendrophilia can be a little bit more difficult to get eating, but it too can be kept once it starts feeding regularly. Feeding and nutrition is so important for these corals that it pretty much frames the discussion of just about every aspect of their care requirements as you'll soon see. So let's get right into it. Unlike most of the corals kept by reef hobbyists, Tabastria are non-photosynthetic. Because Tabastria do not photosynthesize, they can theoretically be kept in an aquarium with no lighting at all. In the wild, you often see them in deeper water or on the underside of caves, that sort of thing. In the home aquarium, one could simulate this by placing sun corals either in caves or under overhangs, but in practice, such placement makes them difficult to view or to feed them. I would not keep them under bright light because I think it's still possible to burn them if extremely intense lighting is used. As a general rule, I would keep them under 75 par just to be safe. Although the coral won't get much in the way of nutrition directly from the tank's lighting, the kind of light provided will make a big difference on the appearance of the coral. Sun corals do not fluoresce under actinic lighting. To best showcase their appearance, I like to keep them under daylight colored lighting to complement their bright yellow color. This is my personal preference, and it's not to say that this coral under blue lighting looks bad, it just gives it a more muted aesthetic. Let's move on to water flow for sun corals. Tabastria are not reliant on strong flow. And in fact, lower flow is helpful during feeding to give the sun corals an opportunity to catch the food out of the water column. The best trick that I've learned is to place sun corals a few inches below a power head. This provides the coral with some shade from the light, but more importantly puts the colony into a swirling flow area. The next time that you feed your aquarium, spray some food around the power heads and look at the area just below the pump. A lot of times I see a flow pattern where the food circulates several times before getting sent across the tank. The effectiveness of this trick depends a lot on your tank dimensions and the kind of pumps you're using. In shallow tanks, the colony can be placed on the substrate or low rock work and benefit from this flow pattern, but in deeper tanks, not so much. A second trick I learned was to take an old algae magnet scrubber and glue the colony onto the wet side magnet and place it under the power head. You can also do this with magnetic frag racks. Feeding has been this recurring theme throughout this whole video, but I cannot stress enough how much food these corals consume. In the past, we struggled keeping Tabastria long term despite feeding the systems twice per day. We achieved success finally by making a frozen food preparation 
and setting it right next to the aquarium with the sun corals. Every time anyone walked by the tank, they were free to feed the corals with a turkey baster. On any given day, they would receive between a dozen to two dozen small feedings. Now, this is not practical for most hobbyists. However, it's kind of perfect for those that work from home or in an office where they see the tank all day long. Another option to feeding could be automatically dosing vitamins and amino acids. I like to dose amino acids, but usually I attribute that more towards SPS rather than a food source for LPS. One company I spoke with claimed that it's possible to provide all of their nutritional requirements this way. I personally haven't tested this out, but it might be something worth experimenting with if you want to bastria but are not around all day to feed it. Just set up a dosing pump system and have it done automatically while you're at work, or sleeping, or both. Sun corals are very active at night and tend to be closed during the day. Clearly this is not conducive to regular feeding unless you're a serious night owl. They can, however, be trained to open up during the day by feeding at specific times consistently. It does take a while for them to reset their internal clocks, so we advise putting in a little bit of food every evening after the lights go out just to make sure that they're going to get some food on their own terms. Once they're used to those daytime feedings, it's easier to stuff them with food every few hours. The only thing at this point that makes feeding difficult is that the fish in the tank also figure out that the food shows up right around these corals and over time learn to steal food from them. After all this talk about feeding tons of food for these corals, we have to address the elephant in the room. How do you feed all of this without absolutely crushing your system? Intense feeding like this could overpower a regular filtration system and lead to sustained high levels of phosphate and nitrate as those uneaten foods break down. Having some phosphate and some nitrate in the water is beneficial, but overfeeding can cause these parameters to rise to dangerous levels that can quickly spiral out of control and lead to a full-on tank crash. If you're going to try these corals, it's best to prepare well in advance to manage the nutrient load. Here are a few tips that I can share. The first tip is to oversize nutrient removal, which breaks down to water changes and protein skimming. But I'll also touch on things like algal filtration and other kinds of filters. I recommend going with a skimmer that has a much higher rating than your current water volume. While I think that skimmer ratings are largely made up figures with no consistency between brands, at a certain point, you know when you're getting into monster skimmers. If I get the feeling like I might be overdoing it, that's the sizing that I'm looking for. The size of the skimmer is not the only important factor. Skimmer performance is affected greatly by how clean it is. There is a big difference between a skimmer that is regularly serviced versus one that's all gunked up. The obvious way to keep a skimmer clean is to employ some elbow grease and scrub it out a few times a week. If that maintenance schedule is a little high maintenance for your lifestyle, there are ways to automate skimmer cleaning with varying degrees of effectiveness. For example, giant RK2 skimmers have spray down systems to clean both the neck and the collection cup. Rossmont skimmers have a controller that allows for periodic over skimming to dislodge accumulated organics on the neck. Reef octopus skimmers have an optional wiper assembly that periodically cleans the neck. Now, none of these automatic skimmer cleaning techniques is a replacement for a full breakdown of the device and thorough cleaning, but they can prolong the service interval and keep the skimmer running better in the meantime. As for water changes, if you've been on this channel for a while, I'm the biggest advocate for doing them. For a heavy nutrient system like this, I would strongly consider an aggressive water change schedule to prevent escalation of these phosphate and nitrate levels. Like with skimmer maintenance, water changes can be automated using dosing pumps to remove and replenish tank water over the course of the whole day. Regardless of whether you go with a regular manual water change or set up some sort of automatic water change system, I think it's a really good idea to invest upfront in a water holding station if you have room for it. Having RO water and premixed salt water on hand is a huge luxury and it makes doing water changes very easy. My fear is, if maintenance is not easy to do, 
it won't be done as regularly as it needs to be. And for a coral system based around tabastria, it's really going to depend quite a lot on this type of easy, regular maintenance. You may be wondering why I'm not recommending algae filter methods. And it's not because I don't like algae scrubbers. In fact, I was a very early adopter of algal turf scrubbers. I have a copy of Walter Aidey and Karen Loveland's Dynamic Aquaria, and even purchased a very early model of an inland aquatics algal turf scrubber. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, this is some early 90s stuff. So yeah, we're talking nearly 30 years ago I was experimenting with this. But the reason that I'm not an advocate for it in this particular application is I really like using Vibrant on a continual high dose to knock down algae growth and to also provide a constant source of bacteria and amino acids which tends to help feed Tabastria. If you don't know what Vibrant is, it is a bacterial additive that is supposed to help control algae and over time pretty much eliminate it from your system. That's a huge oversimplification, but I digress. One of the issues that people often run into with sun corals is that they can get nuisance algae around the skeleton, whether it be valonia or hair algae or something of the sort. Once that sets in, the corals tend to open up less, and it's a downward spiral after that. Less extension equals less food, which leads to more recession, which leads to more algae, etc., etc. So right off the bat, I want to use some manner of bacterial algae control, which I don't think is compatible with algae turf scrubbers. If I'm wrong about that, let me know in the comments below, but in our experience, using Vibrant heavily just crushes all kinds of algae. Aside from removing waste directly, you might want to look into biological media plates that are effective in processing nitrogen to less and less toxic compounds. The idea behind these media plates is that they provide enormous amounts of surface area for nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria to colonize, similar to what happens in live rock. The outer surface of the rock exposed to oxygen grows aerobic nitrifying bacteria, which converts toxic ammonia and nitrite into less toxic nitrate. In the core of the rock, with little to no oxygen present, anaerobic denitrifying bacteria is present to convert nitrate into nitrogen gas, which bubbles out of the tank. There are subtle differences in the brands that make these biological media plates, and your mileage may vary. In our systems, we are trying out a few different ones and see how well they do. What's nice is if they're not keeping up with the nutrient levels, you can always add more, or if you find that the levels are too low, which is a thing, you can always remove one or two. Lastly, a quick thought on filter socks for mechanical filtration. I don't love them for this application, but they will certainly work. My concern is there will almost always be food chunks in the water if you're feeding heavily and these socks clog fast. If you're the type of hobbyist that can micromanage their tank, go for it. But I like just about all other methods that we talked about much more. If things are going well, Tabastria will start sprouting additional polyps from their base. They actually grow pretty fast for a large polyp stony coral, on pace with something like Micromusa or Blastomusa. As such, they will need a steady supply of calcium and alkalinity in the water to build their skeleton. Real quick, calcium is one of the major ions in salt water. In the ocean, its level hovers right around 425 parts per million. As a coral grows, Calcium is absorbed from the water and used to form its calcium carbonate skeleton. Alkalinity, on the other hand, it's not a particular ion, but rather a general figure of carbonate availability in the water. There are dozens of compounds constantly interacting that make up the alkalinity in salt water. The formal definition of alkalinity is the amount of acid required to lower the pH of salt water to the point that bicarbonate turns into carbonic acid. If you have more alkalinity, it can soak up more acid. Less alkalinity and you have less buffering capacity, making the tank more susceptible to chemical changes. In the wild, the alkalinity of the water is right around 8 to 9 dKH, which stands for degree of carbonate hardness, though some aquarists like to overload this parameter a little to keep their tanks right around 10 or 11 dKH. 
Now, there's some belief that having elevated calcium and alkalinity in the water contributes to faster stony coral growth. Regular water changes should be sufficient to keep up with the chemistry demands of these corals, especially if you're doing water changes on a more aggressive schedule to help control nutrients like we talked about earlier. Still, it's possible for heavily stocked mixed reefs with lots of stony corals to need additional supplementation such as calcwasser, calcium reactors, two-part dosing, or some combination. Whether that's going to be necessary or not, not really sure. Because another thing to consider is how much calcium and carbonate the coral is getting from feeding. Here at Tidal Gardens, we basically are shoveling shrimp and plankton into their mouths. So all those stony skeleton building ions, they're in there somewhere. Now, honestly, I don't have any empirical data on that, but they might be getting everything that they need from feeding. As a practical matter, just to be safe, it's best to keep the tank chemistry as stable as possible in the range of natural seawater. Okay, that does it for this coral spotlight on Tabastria. So what kind of tank do I recommend this coral for? Honestly, I don't really recommend this coral much, unless the reef keeper is really committed to one of the most high maintenance corals on the market. It needs a lot of food, and that can be taxing on both the hobbyist's attention, as well as the filtration and nutrient management systems of your reef. Now, if you are that highly committed reef keeper, hopefully this video provided some helpful information for you for your first attempt, or talked you out of a potentially frustrating experience with this coral. If you got something from this video, please help us out by hitting the like button as well as subscribing to this channel. We have a goal this year of hitting 100,000 subscribers, so any help would be greatly appreciated. All right, guys, until next time, happy reefing.